So we are recording now. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna, and I'm delighted to be with you from the New York Open Center. The New York Open Center is the longest running urban holistic health education center in New York, and we do believe in the United States. We are so happy to still be with you. We've moved all of our programs online in the short term while we are uh, stabilizing after through COVID, and we really look forward to having a brick and mortar back in the heart of, the, of New York City uh, soon. Uh, since 1984, the Open Center has been a gathering place, a training site, a practice place for people interested in spirituality, uh, personal growth, and the healing arts. And we've been incredibly blessed to be a on a, a home base for incredible teachers and practitioners like my new friend, Dr. Peter Bongiorno, who is uh, zooming in with us from Staten Island. No, Long Island. Now you're in Long Island, okay. The other island. <laughs> Originally from Staten Island and now That's from right. Long Island. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really lovely to have you today. Um, so the conversation for us today is managing pain and anxiety naturally. And mm -hmm. Dr. Bongiorno is, um, is also leading in this Wednesday, so coming up this Wednesday, September 23rd, a program, it's a three-hour three program on Wednesday evening called Break the Pain Cycle, Natural Home Remedies That Work. And that's an incredible topic that we can all use at some point in our lives. Next Wednesday, you're leading another three-hour program on September 30th called Put Anxiety Behind You. So today, Peter and I are going to play in the realm of pain, anxiety, immune, bu uh, immune building, and um, there's a lot deeper that you can get with Peter if you join us uh, this coming Wednesday and next Wednesday. All this information is online at opencenter.org. And uh, there is a special rate if people sign up to both Wednesdays. There's actually a, a pretty steeply discounted rate. We really want as many people to come uh, from all over the world in all time zones. It's available to come and get the wisdom from Peter. So, so that's the spiel. And now we're going to dive into pain and anxiety. A proper introduction for Dr. Bongiorno is that he is a naturopathic doctor and an acupuncturist. He has served as the president of the New York Association of Naturopathic Physicians, and he has received the Physician of the Year Award, which is quite a, an honor. You are also an author. And you have the, the best titles of books that I have heard. One being, How Come They Are Happy and I'm Not. So that's a fantastic book. And the second book is Put Anxiety Behind You, The, the Complete Drug-Free Program. So thank you for having us. Thank you for having me. And I can't, I'm looking forward to our conversation. But first, I want to know, how did you get involved in naturopathic, uh, being, becoming a naturopathic doctor? I do trust, I do believe you're an Italian. Yes. From Staten Island, New York. Very much so. <laughs> so you, you, sure. where did this love come from and yeah. how did you get to where you are now? Actually, now I was talking to a patient yesterday. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, Friday. And he was telling me, actually, he saw my name and he said, you're Italian. And I said, yes. He said, well, actually, he goes, you're not even Italian, you're Sicilian. <laughs> so, oh. so, and that's actually true. I think the Sicilians don't even think of themselves as Italian. <laughs> we kind of stay, stay off of the mainland, but so that's kind of, I was just thinking of that when you were saying. That's great. That's, well, that's an important distinction to me, right? For, for your fellow <laughs> yeah. Italians who know the difference, that's a good Right. I don't, I don't know if that's good, but it's a difference. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, I, um, I grew up on Staten Island, a very Italian family. And, um, and you know, we, we had no interest in natural medicines, right? Uh, my parents were immigrants that came to this country. They, you know, they wanted to assimilate. And part of the assimilation is really to go to the conventional doctor and 
get a shot and, you know, take the pill and do what the doctor tells you because it's the United States and, yeah. and healthcare is better here. Right. Yeah. So, um, so that's kind of how I grew up as a first generation, um, you know, just going to the doctor, taking my shot and my butt and that was about it. Right. And, and taking over the counter, uh, drugs when I didn't feel well. Right. And, um, and then, uh, when I was in, uh, in college, I, uh, I had an interest in going to medical school, but, um, you know, I was back and forth about it. I, I had done some volunteering in hospitals and research labs and, and, and I liked it and I didn't like it. I, I, you know, it, it, there were things about it that just didn't feel right to me. And I wasn't sure I wanted to pursue that. So I did what my immigrant Italian parents wanted me to do. I joined a rock band after college instead of going to medical school, which is what I told them I would do. And uh, yeah, they were thrilled about that. And uh, so, um, and, you know, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I actually um, also at the same time started doing some research at Yale and one of my mentors from Yale uh, had an opportunity at the National Institutes of Health, which is in Bethesda, Maryland. It's this big government research facility where people from all around the world come and do research. And um, so, uh, so he, uh, he asked me, his name is uh, Giulio Licinio. He said, oh, you want to come down to DC? It's a really good opportunity. And I, I thought, wow, that sounds fun. You know, maybe I'll do research and that'll be my interest. So I actually took the band with me. We all went down to DC and I played music down there and we had a recording studio and I was doing research. It was a really important time for me because I was learning about what made me happy and what I enjoyed and what I didn't. And I learned a lot both musically and doing research. And, and while I was there, I had a friend who had uh, multiple sclerosis um, and she was diagnosed. We were the same age, like 22 or 23 at the time. And and uh, she got quite sick and, and, and she ended up using um, what I thought was weird and odd, all these natural remedies. She went to these natural doctors that I'd never heard of. And I assumed there were some sort of quacks or something, you know, um, you know, because they told her, well, you got to change your food and you have to, you know, work on stress and acupuncture is good and, and all these things that you know, none of the regular doctors ever said. And, um, but, but despite having, you know, started having a lot of symptoms with um, vision and, and, and with walking and dizziness and all this, um, you know, she started improving. And that was after the conventional medical doctor said, well, you know, just go get a wheelchair while you still have a chance, you know? And, um, and that was kind of my aha moment, watching her improve and saying, wow, you know, that's really interesting that all these regular doctors really had nothing for her um, except some drugs which weren't were making her feel worse and and yet this natural medicine seemed to help so doing some of the research I, I looked it up oh we have stalled. Mm -hmm. And what the um, what what the article showed was that the people who followed conventional care went on to have exacerbations and little by little got worse and worse and worse, um, as would be expected. And the people who followed the slow saturated, actually high polyunsaturated fat, which is the healthier fats and took the vitamins, did exceedingly better, had very few exacerbation rates and very few went on to have more disability. And when I remember reading that study, I was sitting at NIH and I read that study, you know, I was in the National Library of Medicine, you know, which is like the bastion of conventional medicine and where all the publications are. And I remember looking at that publication and I went, wow, you know, how come how come doctors weren't talking about this? Why, why, you know, this is all here in the literature and, 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 he, and, he, and he discussed how food affects inflammation, affect, the inflammation affects the brain, and of course it's an inflammatory condition. And it's a, it all made total sense, you know? And so from then on, I got interested in natural medicine. I thought to myself, wow, you know, this is, it makes a lot of sense, it's safe, it can really heal difficult diseases. Because up until that point, I thought, 
you know, well, if you have a real disease, you got to go to a real doctor, you know, and, uh, and now I started realizing that actually natural medicines had a lot of potency and a lot of power. Mm -hmm. um, and that and oftentimes, the quote, real doctors didn't actually offer what natural medicines could. So that that got me excited. And I decided, I want to study that. <laughs> yeah. So did you go to medical school or what, what program, what type of program does? Yeah, so that's a good question. So naturopathic doctors go to a naturopathic medical school. So it is a four-year medical program postgraduate, meaning after college. And we do study what conventional medical doctors study in terms of like first year you get anatomy and physiology and biochemistry and mm -hmm. and then the second and third year you get all the ologies like pathology and immunology and then you learn how to do physical exam and give shots and you know uh, minor surgery and drawing blood and all the things that you expect from a conventional doctor you also receive in naturopathic school you do get less drugs you don't get as much training in drugs Mm. And you don't really get as much hospital-based training. It's more out, outpatient, outpatient clinic work. Mm -hmm. So more of a primary care physician. Mm -hmm. um, but despite all the conventional stuff, you also get a lot of training in naturopathic therapeutics. So you learn the philosophy of naturopathic medicine, which is um, to try to get the body to heal itself using the most natural methods possible. So we're not taught to be against drugs or surgery but we're taught to really use them judiciously because you know there there's there's an acute or emergent reason that really you know you just want to make sure the patient's safe and that's the proper use of drug or a drug or surgery otherwise start with natural medicine so in that spirit we get a lot of training in nutrition we get a lot of training in exercise, lifestyle therapy, counseling work, how to lower stress, um, and also vitamins and botanical medicines and homeopathic medicines and things that are just, in their essence, very, very gentle and are designed to help the body heal itself. Mm. So, and, um, so that's, that's what you're studying in naturopathic school. And then there are residencies Although because there aren't enough residencies in all the places that naturopaths are, right now they're not required. As, as more and more naturopaths um, graduate in, in the future, they will be completely, re completely required as well to do residencies. Okay. Um, and we're not licensed in all states yet. Um, we're licensed in about 24 states. Okay. And, and in those states, yeah. what's that? New York is one of them. New York actually is not one of them. Okay. Um, interesting. Yeah, interestingly, Connecticut's been licensed since 1922. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, Pennsylvania is licensed. Maryland is licensed. D.C. is registered. Uh, New Hampshire, Vermont is licensed. Massachusetts was licensed a few years ago. The whole West Coast is licensed. But New York is pretty far behind. Yeah. Um, and I, that's something I've been working on with the New York Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Um, but the, you know, the medical society has a pretty strong hold on the legislators yeah. and, um, you know, and for various reasons, there's a lot of influence on legislators there and, um, which I won't go into, but, um, but, but, you know, what we really need is to have everyone listening, call their legislator, their state legislator. So in Albany and tell them that they would like the naturopathic medicine bill passed because it's there and it's ready and it can be passed. But because legislators either don't believe in natural medicine or because they're just listening to the ear of the medical society, you know, who has a very influential ear, um, it hasn't passed in New York yet. So we're working on it, but we are passed in, in about 24 states now. That's amazing. Well, I, I really, I want to encourage our viewers to uh, find you. I did a lot of research on YouTube and saw a whole line of wonderful videos oh, where thank you, you explain so much and you explain it with a lot of science, a lot of data. It's, a, it's medicine that you're translating to the non-medical person like myself. I found it to be so compassionate. You are an excellent translator. Your work, it was very compelling. And so you have a superpower there. And so for anybody who wants to learn more about you and to be convinced of the depth and, and uh, the solidity of your work, uh, YouTube, uh, 
Googled on, by your name would be a great way to, to access you. And thank you for thank doing you. your work. And someday New York will be licensed and we'll catch up. Yeah, let's let's hope. You know, it's it's interesting because you know, for everyone listening, um, that you should always remember um, the word doctor. Um, it comes from a Latin term, docere, which means to teach. Mm. So inherent in the word doctor means that person should be a teacher. And uh, so when you go see a doctor of any sort, uh, a healer practitioner, um, if they're not a if they're not bringing it to you in a way that makes sense to you, then in a way they're not really being a doctor in the full sense. So it's, you know, so it's up to you to ask them questions and say, listen, could you explain that to me? Cause it really needs to make sense. Cause if I have a patient who doesn't understand why I'm asking them to make a lifestyle change or take a, a vitamin or something like that, that means I didn't do my job, right. you know? So, so as a patient, it's okay to be a little demanding and say, hey, explain this to me. I really want to understand this. Because that's what brings health, you know, when, when you really understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, it, 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 it makes the process move uh, a bit stronger. Mm, that's great. So can we talk about anxiety? And We can. <laughs> can we and I'm going to ask kind of a question that may seem kind of, I don't know, a weird question, but I'd like you to tell me what is anxiety? And the reason I ask you is because I wonder if there aren't more of us who have some level of anxiety that we don't even recognize in ourselves and that we just chalk up to, oh, well, this is modern living. Um, I'm just amped up. Mm. My mind just is racing because I drank too much coffee. You know, all the way to, I know there's different levels of anxiety, including a full-blown anxiety attack, which is obviously stops you in your tracks. But do you, what would you describe, like, what's anxiety? Sure. Well, let's start with fear, right? Because fear is a, is a normal response to a, a, a dangerous situation, right? So the example I often give, and I give in my books, is if a bear is coming after you, you know, you see the bear, and you get afraid and, and all these changes happen in your body, your stress hormones go up, your blood supply goes you know, to your arms and your legs, your heart pumps faster, um, and it readies your body to run you know, or fight or hide or do something to try to get away from danger. And, and that's, that's a normal, healthy response, right? Um, anxiety is really when your body stays at some level of fear, especially when there isn't an obvious danger like that, mm -hmm. you know, so your body, um, you know, the chemicals in your body changes, your stress hormones go up, your heart beats a little harder, maybe your blood pressure goes up, um, all, all of these things happen, but there's no clear danger that would suggest why your body would want to do that. And, um, and that to me is anxiety. And then there's different levels of anxiety. Um, you know, to the point where some level, like you said, some level, some anxieties get to the point where it stops you in your tracks and then you, then you can't function or you start to avoid things or you do other things to kind of get around the anxiety. But there's a lot of people who live out there and they're functional, but they just feel really crummy all the time because they're just have this low level anxiety or, or this almost like tremor feeling inside or this kind of doom feeling or something, or this, um, a lot of patients describe to me this, I, this feeling of almost being a little detached, you know, or like things are surreal. Um, but they go on day to day, you know, they might have tingling in their hands and their feet or, um, or these nondescript pains sometimes. Um, so that can be anxiety too. So there's kind of a whole continuum of what anxiety can be from just not feeling so good and not really enjoying life the way you should all the way up to completely stopping normal function because of how you're feeling. Okay, that's, that makes sense. So uh, you're, the programs that you offer at places like the Open Center or other places where it's educational, is to empower us to support our own self-healing if we need further support if we're not able to do it if the things that we're not applying don't have an impact we can walk into your office and actually work with you as a doctor is oh absolutely mm -hmm. yeah okay. yep. 
Yeah, I have, we have two offices, one in Midtown, right near Penn Station. Okay. And, uh, and we, we also have an office in, uh, in Long Island, All in right. Huntington. Are you doing mm -hmm. virtual? Uh, I do. Mo you most of our patients, we're still, um, uh, we're recommending people do virtual as much as possible right now, although we are going into the office and seeing patients in person, especially for acupuncture, because I haven't quite figured out how to do acupuncture virtually. <laughs> so, um, but I am also a licensed acupuncturist, so I have that training. And um, but m most of our patients right now are virtual just because, you know, we, we do believe it's best to, to have people have, you know, minimal contact for now until we get, we move through this. That's great. So, so what would you say to our viewers? Um, it's high, it's 2020, the election's upon us. It's high. Uh, COVID. There's an election. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't notice. <laughs> you know, the, there's fire. I mean, I, yesterday I dropped in and really sat and spent a few hours reading the newspaper and finishing the articles, not scanning, but really mm -hmm. staying present. Yeah. And closed the paper and thought, this is going to send me through the roof. It is mm. so scary. And so I know it's important to be aware and to be in yeah. face what's real. But um, what do we do? What would you tell us how to support ourselves right now? Right. Well, I mean, obviously for everyone, it's a little different. So it depends on what the anxiety is for a particular person, you right. know. Um, people worry about different things. So uh, I, I, I don't know. Dance. I, I would say you know, for everyone listening, no matter what the anxiety is, and, and this is what I talk about in the books, is, you know, it's really, the anxiety is really a, a symptom that's at the tip of the iceberg. And, and there's a lot of reasons underneath why people are anxious. Certainly, you know, what's going on in the world is, is reasonable to make anyone fearful and anxious. Um, but there's a lot of things we do have control over that'll tell us whether it's gonna go over the top and create a situ situation of chronic anxiety. So making sure we get enough sleep is absolutely critical. Making sure we're exercising and moving our bodies and burning those stress hormones, um, eating the right food, you know, healthy foods, good anti-inflammatory foods, having bowel movements every day. That's all been shown. And I'll talk about this in the lecture in detail, like which foods and how so, like, you know, because these things have really shown um, on their own to lower anxiety to the point where people won't cross that threshold to actually being anxious. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are certain nutrients that when they're depleted, they'll contribute to anxiety. And then there's certain nutrients and herbs and amino acids that when people have anxiety and you take them, they'll actually support areas of the brain and the gut to actually raise the calming neurotransmitters and lower the excitatory neurotransmitters. So this way you're less likely to kind of go over the edge and feel overwhelmed and sometimes even paralyzed by anxiety. Right. So, okay. Yep. That's great. And so then that three hour lecture, I mean, you can't give us the whole mother load right now, but that three hour lecture will be an opportunity to get more detail and. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. and you know, and what I really want people to leave with is very concrete ideas of what they can do. It's not going to be all theory and, and a lot of scientific, uh, stuff. There'll be a little bit of scientific stuff in the beginning because I, I find when people understand their own bodies and their own physiology, yeah. then they can make better choices. Um, but the vast majority of, of both lectures, I'll be doing a pain, a lecture on pain this week, and then, in, and then following that would be an anxiety lecture next week. Yeah. Um, it, you know, my idea is to really hand uh, the listener and the viewer concrete steps of what they can do to, to lower pain and lower anxiety. So that's really, you know, that's the idea of this because, you know, really most natural medicines are things you can do yourself. You don't, you know, people don't need me. They don't need other doctors. They need the knowledge though. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they have to do them, you know, and sometimes that's really my job is to kind of help people understand in a clear way what they are, but even more so to be, how to be accountable for it. Um, because we all need that, right? I mean, 
Uh, when I know things that I'm working on, I, I like to have people I can go to to hold me accountable for them. Right. And, and that's what I do for my patients. You know, we check in and we make sure it's getting done. And, and it's, it's not even about barking orders and making sure it gets done. It's more about understanding when it doesn't get done. Well, what are the challenges there and how can we, you know, change things so that this works for you. It works for your schedule. It works for your preferences. Right. Or how can we, you know, start to modify those in a healthy way so that your preferences move towards something that's more healthy for you. So, so it sounds like a real partnership, like a, not a coach, but you're a partner, you're, you're a mentor. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, um, you know, and, and studies show that the, um, the relationship between a practitioner and the patient is as important, if not more important than the actual therapy. Okay. So in terms of uh, being effective. Wow, yeah. that's great. Um, you're making me think of the doctors that I've had that was the complete opposite of that. Aww. I'm like, I can't believe you have said nothing to me or have just said that to me, like get me out of here, but sometimes yeah. you can't. Anyway. Yeah, well, I think sometimes, you know, especially in conventional care, it's, you know, they have, they have a, you know, it's kind of like the military, you have to stay on time, and you can't spend a lot of time with people, you have to check the boxes for insurance, and, and it becomes a situation where sometimes it really takes away from the ability of, you know, really well meaning practitioners right. to, to do the job they were really originally intending to do when they got interested in medicine. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, in a way, I feel blessed because I've, I've stayed outside of the do those things. So I, um, you know, it's just, you know, I think sometimes doctors are doing the best they can what they have. Right. Fair, fair enough. So um, can you, so I want to move to the conversation of pain because we promised our viewers a little bit of conversation of pain as well. Um, pain to me, I, I know very little about it, but it feels like it's a different system when you actually have acute pain in your body or chronic pain. Um, the idea of being able to manage it at, on our own seems harder to imagine, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that's not true. Yeah. Well, I mean, it certainly is difficult for anyone listening out there who has chronic pain, especially, um, you know, they'll tell you it's, it, it takes your life over. I mean, we all know we can, you know, if you get like a, a right. splinter in, in your nail, it, it's hard to think and function, you know, and that's just a splinter in your nail. Imagine something bigger than that, that's con chronic and constant. So, um, but, you know, like I was saying with anxiety, the, the same paradigm really applies. There's um, pain, there's a lot of factors involved in pain. You know, it's interesting because, um, if you look at studies on low back pain as an example, right, they, you, you can have an x-ray show very significant degeneration and problems with those vertebrae and yet very minimal pain. And then you can have other people with the same high level of low back pain and they could have very minimal uh, damage or, or, or problems uh, structurally and still have a lot of pain. And then you have other people with a ton of damage and virtually no pain, huh. right? So, so it, what's been shown is that um, the uh, you know when you look when you look at the imaging, the level of damage doesn't really relate to the amount of pain. Hmm. So what that tells us is there's a lot of factors involved in why people have pain, um, and certainly the you know the structural issue is a part of it, but oftentimes isn't the whole picture. In fact, I I would submit that. 80% of the time, it isn't the whole picture. So, and, in, and, and because of that, there's so many places we can help helpfully interfere with that pain cycle and bring relief. And, uh, and, that, and there are a lot of natural ways to do that. So that's what the, the, this lecture is gonna be, this workshop is gonna be about. Like what, you know, what things can you do at home because that's the beautiful thing, all these natural things you can do at home to really relieve the pain. Wow. So I'm going to stretch here, and you're, it's fair for you to say it's not really possible to do this, but could you give us like a, a at-home thing we could do today for any of us who are in pain at home 
something we could turn around and make happen today? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, when I go, when I talk about the course, I'm going to talk about different kinds of pain because the first thing to do is really identify what kind of pain it is, right? Because if, if you, if you don't do that, then you don't understand from its basis, where is it coming from? If I had to pick one thing that I think helps the vast majority, um, you know, there's a, when I was in naturopathic school, we had a, a shift in our clinic called hydrotherapy. And, it, and it's using water to cure lots of different things. And we used, and we would use different kinds of hot and cold baths to not only work with pain, um, which I thought, you know, we saw phenomenal results, but even, even to help, uh, we had an HIV clinic, patients with HIV, to watch their white blood cells go up, cool. um, to watch organs that weren't doing well get better. Um, and the idea of hydrotherapy is when you use warm water, you, you vasodilate vessels and you bring blood to an area. And then when you use cold water, you vasoconstrict blood vessels and you take blood away from an area. Mm -hmm. And that movement of blood in and out to a body part can be very, very effective to help relieve and fix many different kinds of issues, including pain. Um, I know it's my first go-to when I have an issue. I've been running for 20 six years now, you know, and exercising and, you know, now I'm 52 and it's a little easier to hurt things than it used to be, you know, when I was in my twenties. And, uh, and that's, I would say my first go-to. We'll talk about a lot of other things. And, and my only caveat to that was if people are prone to clots or things, or, you know, they might want to check with their doctor before doing things like that. And we'll talk about the, the you know, It's very expensive. It's water. It's something you could do at home. And, um, and it really uh, is an amazing way to bring relief rather quickly. Right. That's fantastic. Uh, could you provide the same answer to if, if somebody is home and wants to support themselves with anxiety, is there something that they can do like right now be, right. that you could advise? Sure. Well, when it comes to anxiety, I think... Um, you know, and that's something I had personal experience with is, uh, you know, when you have anxiety, it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a tidal wave coming at you. And usually when you, when you feel, when you see that tidal wave and you're feeling it, you know, the inclination is naturally to run, you know, to get away from it, to do whatever you can. And usually when you try to get away from a wave, what does it do? It kind of slaps you silly, right? <laughs> it's a, and it feels even worse. You know, when you, when you learn, um, I, I uh, I had the opportunity to go surfing for the first time last year and I had to face these waves myself. And, and one of the first things the, the, um, the instructor taught me because he noticed I couldn't even get out to, to ride a wave in. First, you have to kind of get through the waves and I was afraid of the waves, right? And, and when he finally, when he realized I was struggling, he said, oh, let me teach you how to get through a wave. I'm like, well, how do you do that? He goes, no, no, you don't run away from it. You don't try to jump, a, you go right into it, right. you know? And, and it was a crazy thing because I'm thinking to myself, what, you go into it? Like, that's the worst place to be. And, but w once he showed me and I went into the wave, what I found is as soon as you went in, it, was, it got quiet and, and the wave passes through you and it's over. And, and that's sort of what it is with anxiety, right? So if I had to pick one recommendation, the first one, and it's not easy, but the first recommendation really is to try not to fight it because when you fight it, it, gain, it gains power. Mm. That's when it kind of slaps you around. Yeah. Um, it's really about like just feeling it and knowing it's going to come and it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of natural things, of course, to do. And, and we'll certainly talk about all the great remedies that are available and, mm -hmm. and, you know, so many ways to not need Ativan and Xanax and benzodiazepines and all that. Um, but in the end, um, you know, as you calm your body with those natural things, what you'll find is it gets easier to just be in the moment and move through it to the point where you feel it, but it doesn't necessarily bother you. Mm, that's good. That's good. And um, mindfulness is allows you to create that distance where you can actually see it separate from yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever right. it is the situation and buy yourself a little bit of time perhaps yeah right mm -hmm. a type of mindfulness or meditation or breathing or yeah absolutely i mean and and those things are definitely um 
practices that are very important in the long term, you know, mm-hmm. to help bring things down a few notches. Right. Um, is it possible, or could you describe what it means to be live an anxiety free life? What does that state? Well, I mean, mean, you know, in its essence, I think it, it really suggests that when you make decisions, it's based out of love, you know, it's based out of your, your enjoyment of life and the things you want to do. Because unfortunately, when you're anxious, and we don't always realize it, but we're making decisions based on fear. We're making decisions, yeah. uh, you know, trying to move away from something or not deal with something or because it's just too uncomfortable. So it's getting to, you know, so I think um, an anxiety-free life, and, you know, I don't think anyone is 100% anxiety-free. We all have some. <laughs> it's, a, it's natural. But it, it's, it's making decisions based on your love of life, not based on fear. Yeah, that's a good. That sounds very good. Yeah, it is good. Right? <laughs> and, and it's true. You can't be the but, best. <laughs> yeah, the human condition has stress in it and um, has fear. It's a hard. It's a hard road, right, for everybody. But being able to resettle and then find your center again and and make decisions from that place is sounds really. As it's, it's something good to aspire to. I know that you have to go because you have your clinic that you have to turn to in patients. But um, one last question is, what would Mm -hmm. you prefer for our loved ones, our friends and our family who struggle with anxiety? How does one best support them? Well, I think as, as a loved one, you're usually not the person who can fix it, right? So that's the first. So in the look at your resources and see who do you think is available to help them. Right. Yeah, I apologize. I know my, uh, my internet's bobbing up and down there. So I hope you can hear me. It's all good. Okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I think the important thing as a loved one is maybe to do your homework and look around and see who you think can be helpful for them. And then make recommendate, you know, make, give them the recommendations and say, you know, I love you and I really care for you. And, you know, I think this might be useful. Um, do you want me to go talk to them and see if they're available or, uh, or do they have a book available? You know, a lot of, a lot of my patients who come to me um, are given my book by loved ones who, because they didn't want to come to me to begin with. Cause you know, it's like, Oh, that's weird medicine or I've tried everything or I've taken St. John's ward or whatever it is. It didn't work for me. You know, and then, but then sometimes when they, people, I know I'm very stubborn, you know, I went, but when I read something myself and it goes through my brain, then I start to warm up to it. It starts to make sense to me. And then I, you know, I'm more likely to commit to a change in ideas, you know, whereas if somebody tells me to do it, I'm probably not going to do it. <laughs> so, right. and, um, right. That's a Sicilian. Um, but, <laughs> so, rock band, uh, <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, so I would say you know, uh, you know, if you know, just finding the resources for them that you think are good and, and bring it to them with love and just say, you know, I'm here for you. I think this would be great. Let me know how I can help. Yeah. Great, thank you. Well, I know that we just scratched the surface, and uh, again, I just really want to encourage everybody. First of all, YouTube is a great resource. Your pra- practice is called Inner Source. Yes, Inner Source Health. Mm-hmm. Your source health, and you are seeing patients broadly yes. outside mm-hmm. of regional New York. And there are two great lectures, presentations coming up on Wednesday, September 23rd, Wednesday, September 30th, 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern time, which is a great time for those mm-hmm. on the West Coast forward. Yes. Right? And um, if you do sign up for it and you are, say, in Europe, you will get the video of it. You may be asleep while it's going live, but you'll get the video of it and it would be very worth it. Oh, terrific. Peter, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to meet you. I love oh your gosh, pioneering spirit and your uh, stubborn Sicilian. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you bring uh, it to the world with such kindness and compassion and really it's so lovely to meet you and thanks for everything you're doing oh, thank you well thanks for all the work you're doing and for all the work the open center does i mean you guys and 
you know, you guys are, have, were doing it for longer than anybody, as far as I could tell. And um, so I really appreciate the energy you're putting out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So we'll say goodbye to everybody. Um, visit opencenter.org. I'll turn off our recording and mm -hmm. then I'll say goodbye to you, Peter. Bye, Bye. everyone. <laughs>